Good morning. Good afternoon. Good night. And welcome to Jazzy Conversations. I'm Teef. And I'm Gigi. And we're excited to be here. Listen, thanks for checking in. Welcome to Jazzy Conversations. I'm Teef. And I'm Gigi. And my partner, G. Miss we are you, back. I oh, miss you, man. We've been off for you, some time. I miss you, y'all. <laughs> Listen, please do not go away on us. I know some of you guys are like, where you guys been? Yeah. But you got to understand on our side, we're very independent. This podcast that you see is very independent. It's three of us. Myself, Gigi, and the best producer yeah. in the world. All right? <laughs> so we work extremely hard uh, for you guys to bring you guys good content, you know? So glad to be back. Man. Absolutely. So and our glad. roster, we have a great roster. Yeah. We was able to nail down 10 very influential people to come on the podcast. So we're looking forward to sharing them with you mm -hmm. throughout the rest of the year. Okay. Absolutely. So today is going to be a good one, G. Absolutely. I can't wait to meet Mr. Higgins. Uh, listen, I don't know his story. Yeah. But from our friend, Dr. Ed Joyner, Satif, Gigi, you got to have this guy on. Listen, what they don't know is what, when when uh, when Doc calls. Oh, that's right. He's like, listen, <laughs> I, I got one for you. I, he's like, hey, hey, listen, I got one for you. You're going to want him. So yes. I'm going to say, Doc, please send him on. Yes, sir. So we're excited, and uh, we're going to hear his story, mm -hmm. and uh, let's just go with it. Let's go with it. All right. Listen, on behalf of Jazzy Conversations, I'm Teef. And I'm Gigi. I hope you guys are ready. You ready? Here we go. Welcome to Jazzy Conversations. I'm Teef. And I'm Gigi. And G, we are back. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, G, sir. I'm excited. We have an amazing guest today. Today we have Ron Higgins. Yes. He's the commissioner of the State of Connecticut Emergency Services and Protective Services. Is that correct? Did I say that correct? Uh, the Department of Emergency Management, mm -hmm. incoming commissioner for the Department of Emergency. Uh, Emergency Management and Public Protection. Oh, this is going to be a serious interview. Absolutely. No he said no it a lot better up, than no me. No cutting up, no fooling around. <laughs> I love, and you have Yale on your shirt. Are you, you want to tell yeah. us? Yeah, sure. So my, my current role uh, for another couple of weeks, few weeks, is I serve as the Associate Vice President for Public Safety and Community Engagement at Yale University. Fantastic. At the Yale University. <laughs> you hear that? I did. So we I are did. on YouTube. We're worldwide. We're, and I want everyone to know uh, Mr. Ron Higgins. Yes. So welcome to the show. Welcome to the show and congratulations on your coming up. Thank you. Thank you, of, Gigi. A lot of success. So a lot of success. So what we like to do here is uh, we want you to tell your story. We try to bring people on the platform that people would not know, even if you're in our small state of Connecticut. And of course, Gigi went to Temple, which is in Philly. I went to school in Ohio. Uh, we have a lot of people in South Carolina. We have a lot, definitely mm -hmm. in, in California, probably more than anywhere. Yeah, <laughs> it yeah, seems yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. um, that wants to know, okay, who do you have on the screen? Let him, let us, uh, him tell us his story. So uh, we want to start at the beginning because we heard the titles. Uh, we know that, again, like you said, you're at the arguably uh, most prestigious school in America, Yale University. Mm -hmm. And let's go back to the beginning. Yeah. What little boy dreams of becoming a commissioner? Let's exactly. tell us some more. <laughs> so, so where are you I'm from? Like, so I, I am. I was born and raised uh, in Ham. I was born in New Haven, uh, spent a couple of years in West Haven. Okay. And then we moved to Hamden. My uh, my family moved to Hamden in mm -hmm. uh, 1970. Okay. okay. And I was raised in Hamden, Connecticut. My parents still live in the home uh, where I was raised in. So I'm a, I'm a Hamden native. Oh, absolutely. All right. Okay, there you go. All right. Now, siblings? Siblings? Siblings, yeah. So I have two older, okay. uh, Thomas and Reggie Jr., and my youngest, uh, Ryan, who lives in Maryland. All right. And, okay. and you're the baby. You said you're the baby, or you said you have a younger? No, no, if you're from the South, you're known as the knee baby. No, you so didn't. I'm the uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yes, yes, yes. Now, you said the South. What part? What part is your family from? South Carolina. So, so my mom is from a town called Farmville, uh, North Carolina. Okay. It's a, in the eastern uh, section of North Carolina, okay. um, right outside of Greenville. Okay. And my dad is okay. from New Haven, but his family roots uh, go back to Nevis. 
Okay. 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 Wow. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right. So, gee, listen, let's just jump right in. Yeah, let's jump All right. right in. So, okay, let's start at the beginning. So, you, your siblings, you were born in New Haven, raised in Hamden. Now, back in those days, which Hamden is an amaz amazing city right now, but back when yeah. you grew up in Hamden, you started out in elementary school, which was what elementary school? So, I went to Alice Peck Elementary School. Uh -huh. my, my sixth grade class was the last class to graduate prior to Alice Peck closing okay. for a number of years. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, okay. my. Because I never heard of Alice Peck. Oh, I've heard of Alice Peck. Oh, okay. Absolutely, okay. yeah. Okay. Mont Carmel section of Hamden. Mont Carmel, okay, okay, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Quinnipiac University. Yep, so, yep. Yeah. All right, gotcha. <laughs> so now you graduate. Now, what, what, what type of student were you? Uh, elementary? So, yeah, so <laughs> I, you know, I was, I was probably an, an average student uh, due to just not really being motivated around education, okay. you yeah. know, growing up in a home. So my dad was a police officer oh. for New Haven, New Haven PD. Um, my mom was a stay at home mom for many, many years until I was about 12 or 13. And then she took a job at Whitney Manor convalescent home, mm -hmm. uh, okay. right on Whitney Avenue. In yeah. Hamden. Very familiar. And so, yeah. So both my parents worked a lot. And I had all the resources, Sylvan Learning Center, support. I mean, you name it, had all the resources. But I, I was an average student coming up through elementary school. Something happened right around the time it was time for me to go to um, junior high school. Okay. See, at the time, uh, at the time, the town of Hamden had two junior high schools. There was Sleeping Giant Junior High School, which was for like the northern uh, side of Hamden. And then there was Michael Whalen Junior High School. Michael J. Whalen. Oh. Michael <laughs> yeah, J. Whalen, yeah, yeah. right, which was on the southern yeah. side of him. Oh, So wow. it was at the time, I didn't realize it, at the time, though, it was a big rift in the town because they're closing uh, one junior high school and all the kids were going to have to go to the south side mm -hmm. of him. So mm -hmm. I was one of those kids. And, you know, let's face it, um, in the early 70s and growing up in the 80s, I had a wonderful childhood, but there weren't very many families that looked like us. Uh, so, you know, f for me going to junior high school on the south side of Hamden with a lot more kids and a lot more kids that looked like us, um, it, it, it was it was a challenge for me. I mm -hmm. was I was kind of big for my age. I was a little overweight, didn't have all the self-esteem in the world. Mm -hmm. So I just found myself getting picked on a little bit and having to defend myself a lot so mm. that translates into getting suspended for fighting right and, you know, right right <laughs> that's the translation yeah. Wow. yeah yeah so so going going through uh junior high school i'll never forget um i i barely made it through my my seventh grade year and the principal came to me and said to me he says ronnell he says you have all the talent in the world you're smart but this behavior has got to change if you have another year like you had this year, mm. you will stay back in eighth grade. And he was, he looked me dead in the eye and told me that. Yeah. And I, you know, so what did I do? I listened at the time, but then I went home for the summer and I started lifting weights in the garage with my brothers and my friends, trying to figure out how, how I was not going to be defeated in eighth grade. There you go. So, yeah. come, so come eighth grade, I come back and, you know, I'm a little more mature, but my my focus and my behavior still wasn't where it needed to be. Mm -hmm. I started to straighten up a little bit towards the end of the year because I knew that I, I needed to pass. But the the principal, true to form, told me, uh, "You're being kept back. Mm -hmm. You're being kept back." So I I I was gonna stay back in the eighth grade. Okay. So I was devastated, embarrassed, and trying to figure out uh, how I was gonna get out of this sure. or, or and through it at the time as well. A couple of friends of mine made me aware that uh, the town of Wallingford, uh, Lyman Hall High School, was starting a satellite program, wherein uh, they were bringing kids from neighboring uh, neighboring towns uh, into an electronics program. So if you wanted to study electronics at a place other than Eli Whitney, mm -hmm. then you can come from another town and, and join Lyman Hall High School in their ninth grade. Mm -hmm. Not knowing anything about Lyman Hall High School. <laughs> now, this is before GPS and uh -huh. all that. <laughs> Say it. <laughs> I, I found the article in the New Haven Register. I went to uh, AAA, got one of those map books. Right. AAA, yep, <laughs> found one of those map books. I got on a Huffy Santa Fe 10 speed bicycle. Wait, hold on, hold on, <laughs> hold on, hold on. This is Ron, the eighth grader. 
Yeah. Eight, okay, eight. yeah. I just wanted to get 14. some perspective. 14. Yeah, 14. yeah, yeah. Okay. Four, four, <laughs> 14 years old. Yes, sir. Home feeling defeated mm -hmm. and at the same time saying, no, I, I need, all I need is a chance and I'll show them. I will I'll, not I'll, surrender to this, this decision. No. no. Yeah, I hear you. So I rode my bike to Lyman Hall High School from the Mount Carmel section of Hamden. And I show up in the lobby at the high school and I want to talk. I looked up who the principal was. I wanted to talk to the principal. They said, he's not available. He, you know, he's he's busy all day. Can we help you? Do you have an appointment? All that. I said, uh, I just want to talk to the principal about a program. They said, well, leave your name and number and he'll he'll call you. I says, well, I, I rode all the way out here. I'd like to wait just in case he comes out. And they said, okay, but he's busy. You're not going to be able to talk to him. These ladies were nice to me. But it was it was clear to me that they were they were playing the gatekeeper. Yeah, of course. So I sat down and it was going on probably an hour and a half, nearly two hours. And I kept seeing this really tall man go back and forth. And he just looked like he was in charge. Mm -hmm. And I I, I kind of sensed that he may be the principal. And finally, the principal, Mr. Dale Wilson, said to the ladies in the office, who, who is this? Why is he here? Why is he sitting in my <laughs> And after they explained to him, he walks over to me and says, can I help you? I'm the principal. And I told him my story. And I said, you know, this is who I am. This is what happened. I want to join the electronics program. And if you give me an opportunity, I, will, uh, I won't let you down. Mm -hmm. And he said, you rode your bike all the way out here to say that to me? I said, yes. He said, do your parents know where you are? That was my said, question. I said, no, they, not they, back they, in those days. not back in those days. <laughs> and, and so he, he, he says to me, he says, okay, Ronel, I'm going to call your principal and I'm going to ask him if what you're telling me is the truth. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me because I, I think he wanted to give me an opportunity to say to, whatever to, else. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. right. <laughs> and I said, okay. And the next thing you know, about four, three or four days later, my my mother, my father's at work and she comes in the room like, you're going to get it. Yeah. And, <laughs> and she's like, what did you do? And I said, what do you mean? What now? And, and she says, well, um, they want to meet with me and you over at Hamden Middle School. And I want to know what happened. Mm -hmm. And I told her what I did. And she said, you did that? And I said, yeah. So she didn't tell my father. So she she accompanied me to Hamden Middle School. I'll never forget that day. And I, I, I walk into the principal's office with my mom and the principal walks in. I'm not going to say his name, but he he was a decent man, but he was, I didn't feel he was kind to me on that day. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he just said to me, I got a print, I got a call from a principal out in Wallingford. And he asked me about you and I told him about you. He wants to accept you into his program. Mm. He says, let me tell you something, Ronell. He says, I'm going to sign I'm going to sign this. I'm going to sign this paper releasing you from the Hamden public school system. He said, so you're going to go to Lyman Hall and you're going to be in the ninth grade. But if things don't go right, you will come back here and you will repeat the eighth mm. grade. And he looked at me with a beet red face, almost like I had done something to him. And I just said, OK. And my mother was like, what's going on with that? And I was like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So. Long story short, my father finds out he was always trying to get us involved in, in a trade because he always felt that you could always make money with your hands. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he wasn't crazy about the way I went about it, but he just said, you know, OK, you're going to learn electronics. Now, truth be told, I hated math. <laughs> and, and, and what's the first thing that they start to hone in on um, in a, for an electronics program is your understanding of math, long math. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So... So that happened, but something happened probably the first week of school as, as I'm pulling out of school um, on the bus, I look to my right and there's, there's these, this football practice going on. I'm saying, Hmm, I like football. Ooh, okay. But I could never play Pop Warner football in Hamden growing up because I was always too heavy. It went by your weight mm -hmm. and I was always too heavy for my age. And I, I I met I made my way down to meet the coach one day and I met the coach and he says, okay, why don't you come out for the team? And I went out for the team. I didn't tell my parents. And the next thing you know, I'm staying after school for football practice. There you go. <laughs> and my mother's like, 
what have you done again? Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> and, I know you, boy. Like, I know you. <laughs> I, pretty much, she's like, your father's going to, you, you're going to get it. And I'm like, so it became a big deal because my father was like, listen, you just, you just barely scraped by and now you're going to be a student athlete. I think that's too much. You need to let it go. And I said, dad, I want to play football. Mm-hmm. And I, and I, um, he, he acquiesced, um, you know, ultimately, but it was, it wasn't without him saying, you know, putting his foot down and saying, no, I just, mm-hmm. I just felt the strong drive. Long story short, I had never played a down a organized football in my life. I end up starting, uh, on the freshman team, I end up starting as a sophomore, and I end up making all state and all who's a tonic league my junior and senior wow. year. What? Wow. And, oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. wow. Absolutely. So at Lim- Lyman Hall, you was a first team all stater. Yes, sir. What position? Wow. I was a middle linebacker. Ooh, be- oh my goodness. I'm loving this. You see me, I, I fall all the way back when you yeah. start talking the football talk. <laughs> I'm loving this. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so let me let me ask, where did your drive come from? Because it sounds like you had very supportive parents. So they they supported you all, they loved you all, but you had a sort of an inner drive to fend for yourself. Where do you, where do you think that came from? North Carolina. But go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think it's a combination of of two things. So my my dad grew up in New Haven. He never knew his dad. Mm-hmm. Um, when he he went to Cross Wilbur Cross High School, and he wrote in his yearbook mm-hmm. that he was going to join the U.S. Air Force and then he was going to come home and join the New Haven Police Department. Mm-hmm. If you look at his yearbook photo, it says it, and he mm-hmm. did that. And he did that. So my dad is a very determined man. Mm-hmm. My mom is very determined as well. Farmville, North Carolina, growing up, and you you ask my cousin, uh, Dr. Ed Joyner, he, mm. he'll tell you how how tough it was. In fact, going from Hamden, Connecticut to Farmville, North Carolina, even in the 80s, mm-hmm. I had no idea how fortunate we were in Connecticut. And also just all the, you know, the world hadn't quite caught up in certain respects um, you know, with acceptance in Farmville at the time. Yeah, yeah. But there was, but there was, there was determination and there was love. Mm-hmm. And there was, mm-hmm. Main so, ingredient. The main ingredient. Mm-hmm. So that that combination is really during my formidable years was really what what made me believe that I was here to do more, and I need to do more. All I have to do is to continue on the path that is in front of me. And not rely upon some of my own, you know, some of the things that we want to do sometimes. It's like right. reduce yourself and trust him. Yes. Wow. Yes. So I'm, gee, I'm loving this story. Me too. I, we didn't know anything about it. I got tons to say. Go you, ahead. You got an amazing story. So so listen, so that drive at 14, yes. riding your bike out there, being yes. very determined. And he already had his mind made up that I'm going to speak to this principal. That's how I look at it. I'm and starting very to... resourceful because this is before internet and I'm just going to Google yes, it. Yes, and I'm gonna, yes. This is this is amazing. Absolutely. But... <laughs> then you play ball. So I already know what that means. That mm-hmm. drive, that hunger, that independence. Prove myself. Yeah. You don't become a first team All-Stater two years in a row and don't have that drive and hunger and that independence that I'm good. I'm nice. Without a history in football. Absolutely. Without having been on a team. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And so, I think it was maybe my, I think my 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 senior year I was first team. I think my 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 junior year I was probably just all hoozy, but the second yeah. year, I, my senior year I was All-State. Absolutely. So w- did you go to school after that? Where'd you go? Did you Yeah, so again, interest, interesting time. I mean, um, at at the time, right around 1989, um, the NCAA came out with a rule called Proposition 48. Yes, they did. And prop, yeah. yeah. Yes, so Prop did. 48 said if you, in order to be eligible for Division One A, One Double A, or Division Two athletics, you have to have a C average. Yep. Okay. So here we go again. Ron out eyes off the ball, off the prize, because I was having so much success. Uh, with football, mm-hmm. I was, you know, not focusing on my studies. I was never a bad student. I just kind of did enough to get by. Mm-hmm. And I fell just below that 2.0. And yet again, I was devastated because there were letters coming to my house every day, Division One, I, Division One, I, AA schools. Mm-hmm. But when it came down to the academics, uh, they couldn't touch me. Yeah. So I'll never forget, I come, I come to school one day and there's this 
I get a call down to the coach's office and he says, this is man that's been here since seven o'clock this morning waiting for you. Mm -hmm. And his name is Chris Rippon. Chris Rippon was the former coach for Western Connecticut State University football. All right. And I'll, I'll, I, I met with a number of division three coaches as well as prep school coaches. I almost went to Milford Academy at the time, mm -hmm. but something just, something just felt right about Western Connecticut State University. So I ended up going to Western Connecticut State University, um, got some playing time as a freshman on the varsity. Didn't start, but got some playing time. And then my sophomore year came back, played some varsity. But I did something that I don't recommend any student athletes do, especially football players. Mm. That is move off campus into the football house. Oh. <laughs> as I tell my students now, uh, I even tell some of the Yale football players now, how much studying do you think got? What's going to happen? <laughs> what, what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> yeah. So so here we go again. Now, I'm not on scholarship, mind you. Mm -hmm. I'm in college, and also my younger brother's in college, and my dad is paying. Mm -hmm. So when, when, when he learned that uh, I was on academic suspension, he looked at me and said, here we go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so mm -hmm. I came, so I came home, I went to Southern for a semester, um, didn't really like Southern. I started taking some classes that it wasn't, it was, a, it was South Central Community College at the time. And um, long story short, I, I needed a job. I was always taking classes here and there, but I needed a job. Mm -hmm. So because I was always taking classes and again, wasn't a bad student, just wasn't really focused. Mm -hmm. A few of my friends and I heard that the Department of Corrections was hiring and we all wanted jobs and they were making a lot of overtime. So we Four of us jumped in a car. We drove to Hartford, not knowing anything about mm -hmm. the Department of Corrections. And um, three, three didn't pass the test. One passed the test. So in 1994, I started working as a correction officer mm -hmm. in Bridgeport. Mm -hmm. But even before that, um, you heard me say my dad was a New Haven police officer. Right. Yes. So yeah. I, I wanted to be a police officer. I already knew what I wanted to do growing up. So. Right around 91, 92, my brother had become, uh, he was beaten by the New Haven police. He, uh, it, was, it was a tough situation where my my dad, now you heard me say my dad was a New Haven police officer. Yes. yes. He was beaten by the New Haven police. Under, yeah. Okay. You don't so, get to wear the badge your father wears. They don't know that you just, just another young black child. My My, my brother ended up suing the city. Um, won Oof. nearly a million dollars, which was a lot of money at the time. Ooh. But my father's career pretty much tanked because, right. you know, if he didn't stand for uh, stand up for his son, who was going to do it? Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Yeah, but he, he 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 did that, and but at the time, I saw what happened. I saw how it impacted my dad. I saw how it impacted my family. And Gigi, I wanted nothing to do with policing. That's right. why I became That's it. A, mm -hmm. a correction officer. Okay. Oh wow. my goodness. Wow. What a great story. It is incredible. And what a stress and a strain I imagine on the provider that this is what was, this is what was bringing the income into the house. This was a source I imagine of pride and right. How, who, how he presented and then to have to relinquish that man, what a struggle. That Ron, I'm been. loving this story because whoever's watching this, even from our city or greater New Haven area or in Connecticut that knows who you are by seeing you, they don't know your story. So right. I mean, I'm enjoying you sitting here telling this story because people are watching right now saying, wow, I did not know that about him. So continue, Chief, please. Chief, I uh, just to share with you about that story. I kept that. That was a, that was a very I could talk about it now, but that was a very personal story. And yeah. I didn't begin to tell that story publicly until after uh, George Floyd's death, Wow. George Floyd's murder. And the reason why I did that is because it, it's it's it was one of those things where it's, I had to show people as a policing leader that yes I can identify yeah there you go with that yeah yeah you know and the more I started telling that story I guess it helped me out personally but at the same time it 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 demonstrated for for others who did not have trust or faith in the police that no 
some of us who are wearing the uniform, yeah, most yeah. of us who are wearing uniform do understand. And yeah. I, I have, I, I'll even go a step further with sharing my experience to just show that I, you know, I do understand the depth of the hurt and pain and the trauma that accompanies, right. uh, that goes along with uh, uh, police brutality. Yeah, I'm so, sure that humanized it for people because we do just sometimes see the uniform and we disconnect mm -hmm. from the story, but you really added the humanity to it. I mean, that's right. so important. Wow. Right. Mm, so mm -hmm. so it's 94 um you know i'm i'm young i'm in my early 20s I'm a correction officer working a lot of overtime making making some good money good money <laughs> yeah and, <laughs> but i but at the time i i just felt that there was a a calling More. upon my life again mm -hmm. here's that drive again yeah mm -hmm. and i said to my dad right around 96 i said dad i, I think i want to try to go out for the police department and he said you should he says policing i'll never forget he said policing needs you Ooh. he says you should so i said i want to go out for the new haven police department oh. and he said should he you should they will uh, they'd be lucky to have you so it was tough going there because growing i grew up in that department mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i went my dad took us to the the union Christmas parties and the wow. events and all the promotional ceremonies were held in the gymnasium adjacent to the police department. So we saw my dad get promoted there a few times and it was just, you know, I, mm -hmm. I used to go there to see my dad at work. I, but I hadn't been back there since um, the incident with my brother, mm -hmm. but I, um, so when I walked back into that gym, it took a lot for me to go there. And at the time we, you know, there wasn't an online application submission mm -hmm. so i had to go there and stand in line and fill out this form fill out that form put it in the back you know do all that yeah. so yeah. as i'm standing there um people are coming up to me saying hey are you reggie son i'm saying yeah how's your dad good blah 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 oh you're gonna join the part oh good we're gonna have another higgins back on the part. so it was good yeah go. yeah it was also I'm, I'm bumping into other police officers sons and daughters who i knew and we were kind of like talking and we're going to go to the police academy together. We're going to do this. This is going to be great. I left there feeling so good. Yes. Weeks go by. Months go by. I'm hearing my friend, this one, that one, and the other. Who who got a, a call? Who took the test? Who Who's in the background? Who's, you know, people are progressing mm -hmm. in this process. And I'm saying to myself, well, maybe they haven't gotten to the H's yet. I don't mm -hmm. know. But um, we had one phone in in my uh, one well two phones, but one phone I can remember in the kitchen in my house. There's this old yellow phone with the long cord, mm -hmm. you know. And, um, <laughs> absolutely, yes, sir. We know that phone. <laughs> remember those phones? Yes, yeah, sir. My mother absolutely. Down the hall on the yeah. phone in the kitchen. Yes, right. Stretch that cord all the way. <laughs> mutilate that cord. Yes, yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. That phone never rang for me. So I asked my dad, who, who still had connections, I said, Dad, can you look into this for me? He says, yeah, sure. So he did. And I'll never forget, he came home one day, and I'm in the kitchen. I'm looking at him. He just looks at me, and he just shakes his head. He says, oh. he calls me Ronnie. He says, Ronnie, are you sure you put an application and you signed it? You did all these things? Oh, no. Former cop, he's, he's taking me through the steps. He knows. And I'm like, of course, I did X, Y, and Z. He's like, he says, they don't have an application for you on file. I said, really okay okay so this is what we're doing uh, mm -hmm. so i just said you know what and we just talked and talked and talked and i i just decided again gg that inner drive i was not gonna let any one person or mm -hmm. persons deter me from That's what right. i knew i was meant to do on this earth mm -hmm. so i just started applying to different police departments and i just i promised myself the first police department that hires me, I'm going to go with them mm -hmm. and I'm going to be loyal to them and I'm going to show others what they could have had. Ooh. This is good. This yeah, is good. this is good. And um, <laughs> Yale University called me first. And although I've had opportunities to, to leave um, on several occasions, even during the academy, I was getting calls and I said, no, 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 no. I made a commitment. And it all began for me um, with Yale in 1997. I began as a 
as a patrol officer. 97. Mm. That was a good year. Mm-hmm. That, that was, was a good, good, that was a good year. year. Wow. We graduated oh, college in 97. Yes, we did. Okay. That, was a, that was a good year. Oh, wow. Okay. That so now, incredible. now this story is oh, it's getting juicy. I'm loving this. Uh, quick question, though. Let me, let me just go back and I want you to jump right from 97. 30 seconds. You graduated 89 high school? I graduated 89, yeah. So, so your partner on the All-State team was Ray Little, a uh, linebacker. Do you remember that? I remember the name. He was Hill House, right? Wilbur Cross. Wilbur Cross. I remember the name. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. I just, I just, okay, let's jump back into 97 because I'm like, wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay, so 97, you get on. All right, now how does that look for you? Oh, it looks great. So, you know, uh, one of the things about working for the Department of Corrections and uh, much respect to the COs, it was that you had to work a lot of overtime. Mm-hmm. Um a lot of mandated overtime. Not mandated, staying so overnight, you, don't go home. Yeah, yeah. and this is yeah. when you can smoke inside the facilities as yeah. well. So, and it was tense. Mm-hmm. So, um, I go from jail to Yale. Jail to Yale. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll never forget, uh, after I go through my training, uh, I get the call on the radio that, you know, I'm being mandated to stay over from the midnight shift to have to work the day shift. Now, conditioned as a correction officer, I'm just like, okay. Mm-hmm. You know, right. it wasn't a, it wasn't a big deal at all. Um, and I was like, wow, I can ride around and see people. I can go to Dunkin Donuts. I can I can do, <laughs> you know, I, right. you know, because it's all about one of the things they taught us uh, in the Corrections Academy is that your number one. Uh, I, I, want, I don't want to say weapon, but your number one tool was your interpersonal communication skills. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if you can hone those, mm-hmm. then you're going to be successful. So I took that. I learned that. I embraced that. And I brought it with me. Uh, to working at Yale and through all the ranks, I used my mouth. I, I just tried to communicate with people, tried to meet them where they are at mm-hmm. varying levels. And the Ronnell you see now is not the Ronnell from 1997. I'm committed to continuous improvement. So this is yeah, about an growth. evolution. Over time. Love it, love it, mm-hmm. love it. Wow. Professional. Yeah. Wow, wow. So that, that sounds like relationship. Like when I hear the translation of this interpersonal communications, being with people, like you had to build relationship with the people all along the way. Is, 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 that, a, is that a fair interpretation? Gigi, you hit the nail on the head. One of the things that I didn't realize was that growing up, so growing up in Hamden, I had two best friends. One was a young Jewish kid by the name of Michael Schwartz and the other one was Ed Gomez and we had all sorts of differences but we all ate at each other's houses and played together we didn't know any nope. you know we just we yeah. were just kids yeah. 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 okay yeah. then I had then I had you know my experiences at Hamden Middle School then fast forward to to Lyman Hall where myself and another one of my good friends Lawrence Barnes we were the only two black kids that graduated in our entire graduating class mm-hmm. So navigating unfamiliar spaces mm-hmm. was something that I had been doing all, all my your life. Mm-hmm. All my life. Wow. wow. So now, okay, so you start to slowly mm-hmm. leave a footprint. You start to move up in ranks. How does that look? Because you go from officer to what was the next step? When did you move up? Sergeant. Yeah, sergeant. So I, sergeant. I hurt, I got hurt about a year and a half into, um, I was working a plain clothes a street crime unit detail, and I uh, I got hurt. I blew my knee out, and I ruptured my patella tendon in '99, mm. and I was out of work for nine months. And when I when I returned to work, um, they had just posted for the sergeant's exam, and I had, you know, I you know I hadn't that much I hadn't had much time on the road, but I was still going to school, taking classes. I had my Department of Correction experience, and I applied, and I ultimately was one of the um, one of the people selected to become a sergeant. And I'll tell you, in 1999, as a young sergeant, again, having to use my interpersonal communication skills, um, it, it things worked out. Um, things worked out. And it was probably one of the best learning experiences of my life. Man, so so he doesn't blow his knee out playing football. No. But he blows it out as an officer. Yeah. <laughs> what, I mean, what does that look like? Come on. Good point. I had to throw that in there. I had to throw that in there. <laughs> So, so 99, you become a sergeant, right? And you're young, you're ready to go, you're ready to prove yourself. And then over the next few years, what's, what's the, what's out the sergeant? So, so, so 99, I, 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 right before the chief decided to promote me, I just said, chief, I will not let you down. Mm-hmm. The same thing I told Dale Wilson, the mm-hmm. principal at Lima yep. Hall, I will not let you down. And 
time goes by. It wasn't until 2005, 2006, I was promoted to lieutenant. Okay. A year later, um, I was uh, nominated and, and went to the FBI National Academy in Quantico, Virginia. Yeah. And that was a transformative experience because not only was I there with um, emerging leaders, policing leaders from around the world, um, I was also, you know, exposed to some of the best law enforcement training and leadership training um, that this country has to offer. Mm. So I, 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 I came back, I brought that with me, and I was um, reassigned to oversee the entire patrol division at Yale University in 2007. Mm -mm. Um, a year later, in 2008, I was promoted to assistant chief of police and... In 2010, uh, my boss at the time, Chief Parati, announces his retirement. Um, they did not give me the title of acting chief. They brought in someone else to serve as acting chief during the interim period. Um, but ultimately, they did a national search, and I prevailed, and I was promoted to chief of police in 2011. Mm. Look at that. I mean, I'm listening to this story. All I see is rungs on a ladder. Yes. You like know, it. just just one rung after the other. And and I said because I people will look at you and think, you know, they want to be where you are. But to yeah. hear the story of from where you came and it's rung after rung. You don't just land there. Absolutely. You climb there. I just I love this story, Ron. Thank I'll, you so much. I'll share with you when wait, you wait, talk wait, about Ron. Uh, we're going to bring you back on. Our producer just told us we have five minutes. Oh, uh, okay. So I'm glad you got to that chief part. Now, we have five minutes. So how does that transition look? So now you're moving into something even bigger, like your new Ooh. title. Yeah. yeah. So in, in, in um, gosh, so, you know, there's a saying that chiefs use, because just the insignias for the rank of chief are stars. Okay. Mm -hmm. Those mm -hmm. stars are heavy. Mm -hmm. It is a weighty responsibility. You are the chief law enforcement officer for this institution, Absolutely. which means you not only have to manage your organization, but you have to manage relationships with the community and you have mm -hmm. to have to manage upwards as well with the leadership. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it was tough. It was tough. It was tough putting a team together. It was tough because at the time crime was starting to creep up again. So my mandate was to prevent and reduce crime. And we did that. We reduced crime since to the lowest level since we began reporting. Uh, to the Uniform Crime Report, to the FBI. And it was almost like, if that was my report card, I got A's on that. There you go. Mm -hmm. I got A's on that. Mm -hmm. Wow, man. This I is, love this. Oh, this story is great. Listen, and you still like look like you could play ball, too. <laughs> still got that look. Still. <laughs> but, look, he said, I ain't taking that. I'm I not taking you up on that right, right now. Right, <laughs> right. But listen, your story has been absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. And I know you got more to tell us, so we're going to have to have them back. You know that's right. I mean, I, I truly enjoyed your story. And, and just his resume alone to say, listen, I've earned my title. I've yeah. earned my position. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he went to the FBI Academy. Yeah. I mean, but play it back. I'm playing it back. I'm like, listen, and I don't want to get, I do want to get spiritual. I'm not going to say I don't want to get spiritual. If you go back and you get that job at, at uh, City of New Haven, your police officer, your picture looks totally different. You go no. to the left, but you want to. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I know you're smiling from ear to ear because it was meant to be to go to the right. It's just like, was. this is crazy. Yeah. No, this yeah. is amazing. Wow. Ron, congratulations on all of Thank your you. success. Absolutely. Before Thank we you. end, my partner has three important questions to ask you. I don't know if you do or you don't listen to podcasts, but we would love for you to share the top three. Let me make sure you see that. The top three podcasts that you listen to. <laughs> oh God. I love Simon Sinek. Mm -hmm. Um, when I'm on the treadmill in the morning, I listen to Jake's. Uh huh. Um, and and then I'm kind of I just listen to leadership. I mean, anyone who has something to say about leadership, I'm so those are my top two. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then and you got one more slot left. You be have, careful yeah, now. Yeah, Gigi. Ah! There you go. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. I was liking this guy there for some time, go. but I'm like, whoa. Yes, beautiful. I love it. I we love appreciate it. it. Hey, Ron, thanks for coming on. Yes. On behalf of Jazzy Conversations, I'm T. And I'm Gigi. Ron, have a great night. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. <laughs> oh, that was a great interview. Oh, fantastic. Oh, that, you know, his story. I mean, honestly. Yeah.
His story to me, mm -hmm. you know how he had Chris Big Dogs on, which I really love. Yes, like, yes, really, yes, I mean, yes, yes. Because he's local. He's not. I mean, we bring on celebrities, and if, if any, any of our celebrities is watching, we love having you guys on. But when I bring on local people and they tell these amazing stories, these story, yeah, it's just really for me. I'm like, wow, I yeah. love this story. Relatable, understandable. Absolutely. Like you can understand. As I'm sure there are many that have had experiences where they weren't they weren't doing well. Oh. They were, you know, they struggled with this, that, or the other, he but was, to see the climb. Open. He was <laughs> open and honest. Listen, I wasn't the best student. Student, right, right. But I was a student athlete. I achieved to the highest level. Yes. I was the first team all stater. Yes. And then from there, I moved forward. Yeah. And he was quick to say, listen, I didn't grow up in the hood. I grew up in, you know, yeah. Mount Carmel area of Hamden, mm -hmm. but I enjoy who I am. I'm confident yeah. in who I am. So yeah. just an amazing story. An too. amazing story. I listen, loved it. We, I hope these... we will have him back on. Oh, I I, I definitely want, I want him yeah. to finish the story. Mm -hmm. um, guys, please remember, hit the subscribe button. Feel free to email us. We would love to have you on the podcast, please. Mm -hmm. Tiff and Gigi at gmail gmail.com. Tiff and Gigi at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. Send us something. Let us know you're interested in being on the show. We literally go through and we try to bring you guys great guests. Yes. All right. Yes. On behalf of Jazzy Conversations, I'm Tiff. And I'm Gigi. Have a great night. Take care, guys.